Hello Retro Gamers and welcome to another video where I fix something. Got a bit of a simpler project today as I make my way through my backlog. Here we have a Game Boy Pocket that, as you can see, is quite yellow, but otherwise in pretty decent aesthetic condition. The only other real problem is the volume knob. Turning it up and down reveals quite a bit of static and inconsistencies, so today we'll be fixing that as well as doing a bit of retro writing to hopefully bring that case back to its former glory. So here's the obligatory proof that it does turn on. You will notice that the battery cover is missing. This yellow one here isn't an extremely UV affected piece of plastic. It's actually just a aftermarket replacement I bought from a website called Handheld Legend. Unfortunately, they've only got a few colors, so this will just have to do for now. But as you can see, it turns on with no fuss at all. Popping in a game, and I'm not sure how well this will come through in the video, but the volume is very inconsistent as you turn it up and down. And also if you just let the music play, it cuts out. So I'm assuming this is probably just a dirty potentiometer, so we'll just have to crack it open and find out. Also, I forgot to film it, but the same issue does happen when you plug in headphones. So this indicates that it's not the speaker that's the problem, but the actual potentiometer itself. Now getting into disassembly, uh, I don't think there's anything easier to pull apart than a Game Boy or a Game Boy Pocket. There are six screws, two of them in the battery compartment, and these use a special tri-wing arrangement on the screw heads, but it's very easy to find screwdrivers that will fit this online, usually quite cheaply too. So once that back case has removed, you'll see that most of the components are contained within the front half of the Game Boy. Inspecting the circuit board, things don't look too dire. There's a bit of flux maybe on these points here and a bit of dust on the speaker, but otherwise things look pretty good. To continue disassembly, there are three more screws holding the circuit board in, but these are just your standard Philip head. Otherwise, take note that the screen is attached via a ribbon cable and the ribbon cable just doesn't pull out. There are two tabs on the bracket there. These just pop up either with your fingernail or a flathead screwdriver. With those released, the ribbon cable should remove quite easily. If the ribbon cable is resisting, I'll just pull those tabs up a bit more because if you rip that out and break it, you're in for a world of pain. After pulling the main circuit board out, I noticed that something seemed to be jammed in the power adapter socket. I'm not really sure what it was. It's kind of as if a plug had been uh, ripped off on a 90 degree angle and the innards had still remained within. So I guess we'll get to pulling that out to keep this Game Boy as stock as possible. Originally I was just hoping I could pull the material out but this wasn't exactly working, I couldn't get a grip. So I just ended up using a small flat headed screwdriver and sort of just carved it out. <laughs> the pin was bent out of position so I sort of just edged that back into shape using the flat headed screwdriver. I don't actually own a power adapter to test if this works, so the best I could do was use a multimeter, and I was able to confirm that I was making a connection to the other side. Regardless, I will only ever be using this for batteries anyway, so it's not a huge issue, but it looks like it's probably operational now anyway. So with that out of the way, I just got onto giving this a bit of a courtesy clean on the inside using my good friend isopropyl alcohol, which by the way is in high demand at the moment in a lot of places. People appear to be clearing out the electronic shops so they can make their own hand sanitizer. Regardless, I'm lucky I bought a new bottle quite recently. And I just worked on cleaning up the bits of flux that probably aren't causing any issues, but I might as well clean them up anyway. And then I got to work on the potentiometer itself. Again, there's not really much to do here. I just sort of clean up the contacts with a toothbrush, as well as spraying inside of the potentiometer and letting it sit a bit, and then moving it back and forth to sort of mix it in there and clean it up a bit more thoroughly. Putting it back together for a quick test, and it was better, but it wasn't quite as good as it could be, in my opinion. It still was a bit iffy. It was really hard to pick up with a microphone. Here's where the headphones plugged in and hopefully that will give a bit of more of a clearer picture. And here I'm just turning the volume up and down. See if you can sort of hear it. But it's not up to retro game on standards quite yet. So I pulled it apart again and did much of the same. And I also just sprayed a bit onto the headphone jack just to clean that up as well, although I don't suspect that as being a problem at this point. And from there, I turn to my other good old friend, distilled white vinegar. This will definitely help with any corrosion, just keep in mind that it takes a lot longer for this to dry than IPA. And with that, I am finally satisfied. It seems to be quite a bit louder now than it was, and the volume turns up and down very smoothly. 
So that we can get started on cleaning it in preparation for some retro brighting. Since these will be submerged in bodies of water for hours at a time, it is a very good idea to remove anything metal since, you know, it could rust. So with the back piece of the case, there are only really two metal components, which is this plate here with very small tiny screws that you are liable to lose, of which I nearly did. Let's watch that again in slow-mo. Luckily I did eventually find the screw, which is very fortunate because I have a grey carpet. Otherwise there is the other side of the battery connectors. These can just be pushed out using a hole from behind and then you can just pull them out with needle nose pliers. And with that the rest of the disassembly is quite straightforward. There are no more screws, all the buttons and their contacts are just held in place and the screen can just be wedged out. I would be very careful of this as you don't want to snap anything, but it shouldn't come out with too much hassle. And then I just got to work giving everything a bit of a scrub. The first container there on the left is just full of warm soapy water, while the one in the middle is just full of clean water to give it a bit of a rinse. And yeah, there's not really much to it. I just basically scraping off all the grime and anything that looks gross. So this will be as clean as it can possibly be before we start to try to reverse the yellowing process. And I don't really know why I did this on my bench like this as I got water everywhere. I cleaned up a SNES controller the night after and I did it in the kitchen sink and it's a lot easier. So I'm not really sure why I made it harder for myself here, but hey, it's what I did and it's what you can see now. So here's my ingenious solution for keeping the bits of plastic from floating in the container of water for the retro brighting process. I'll go into more depth about how the retro brighting process works in a minute, but at the moment I can't really leave the house unless I have a good reason, so I sort of had to hunt around and find something that would weigh it down. And my ingenious solution was two beer bottles and string that is used to wrap presents. That's what I had on hand, but Hey, it worked. And I'll show you how now. So straight up, you will need a nice sunny day, which is something I actually struggled with while doing this. Otherwise, you'll need a clear plastic container to fill up with water. My original idea was to have the beer bottles upright in the water, but of course, when they're filled up and they sink, they're just as effective on their side as they are standing up. So luckily, I could remove some water because the solution I'm about to pour into it, obviously it won't be as effective if it's diluted in any way. Basically, you just want to fill it up enough that everything's covered. And this is what I used, cream peroxide, which is a some sort of hair treatment thing, I'm not really sure, but you can buy it in pharmacies. I know in America you can get clear versions of this, I've been unable to find it here in Australia, but I've used this a couple of times with success. Basically, the plan was to pour it over the components and then I just put some cling wrap over the container just to keep bits of dirt and bugs and whatever else out of the water since this will need to stay in the sun for at least six hours. So, how did we go? Well, not great. It's obvious that the retro brighting process was successful to a degree, but you can see it is quite splotchy in some places. And I figured this was probably where the actual peroxide landed on the case itself. So this will definitely require another session and I'll definitely learn from that mistake. And next time, pour the peroxide just onto the cases themselves rather than just into the water in general. As I said though, I was delayed by a few cloudy days which did delay this project. However, I managed to fit it in, eventually the clouds went away, but on this second session, I was only able to get three or four hours, which isn't totally ideal. I also made the mistake of using the same water from the previous day, so all the existing peroxide was in there, which was good, but since it was so bubbly, I think it was actually restricting the amount of light getting into the water. So that was definitely a mistake I wasn't going to make a second time. So here's what it looked like after the second session, and while not complete yet, it is obvious that progress is being made. The splotchiness is still a little bit apparent, but the colour is catching up to the rest of the case, so it is merging in a little bit better. Just as a comparison, here's what it looked like before the first session, so it's obvious that something good is happening here. So I waited a couple of days for a reasonably sunny day, and at the end of that, I must say I'm quite impressed with the result. As you can see here, it's pretty much gone back to its exact colouring. The splotchiness is a little bit apparent in this photo, the camera did manage to pick it up, but in practice as you're holding it, it's not really something you can see. 
Keeping in mind that the light over it in this shot is yellow, so it is making it look more yellow than cream than it actually is. But if you look at the plastic on the underside, which is the original color and hasn't been retrobrighted at all, you can see that they are matching now quite closely. And that makes me a very happy man indeed. Just to emphasize how successful the retrobrighting process was, here is what it looked like originally, and here's what it looks like now. So now on to the final reassembly, which I must say is always a very satisfying process when you've checked all the problems off the list. And here we are, all working and in tip top shape. So with that, that is the end of this video. I would definitely call this a success, even though it was relatively simple repair, but it is a success nonetheless. And I have a few more handhelds sitting on my shelf here that are awaiting the same amount of love and treatment, so stay tuned for those videos. But with that, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time.